Well, it is that time again. So it is Thursday, our market update. Megan and I are back at our office. Last week, we were on Federal Boulevard. I don't know what that's Federal Boulevard. Boulevard. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we were on the Federal. nice part of town. Oh, that's for you guys. <laughs> you know, it was a great little venue. Uh, it was a stadium in and it was stadium in. It doesn't States, even matter. Yeah, I can't remember. So I can't the, remember the name of it. So it was fantastic. Of course, we had audio issues the first seven minutes because what would a what would an ignite be without audio issues these days? You just gotta lighten up, folks. Like you just gotta lighten up. We're doing the best we can. So <laughs> we we had a fantastic turnout. Man, that that house was packed. It was full. We had 150 people in person last oh week for Patty gosh. Silverstein. It was a really great event. Hopefully, we'll do that again in the future because yes. she's just a really wonderful speaker. She does a really fantastic job. She does, and she's so calming. Mm -hmm. and a little and a little quiet yes <laughs> but she I know that you're going to do some recaps of mm -hmm. that um so we're going to get started you're going to talk about what's going on in the Denver market I'm going to talk about you know what happened the Fed met the Fed and, the, met. and the Fed raised the Fed rate so what does the market think about the 75 bips that the Fed just raised their Fed rate we're going to talk about that because the night before that happened Sweden just raised their central bank rate uh one point or 100 bips so what does that do so let's start out with a quote let's get over to Megan and talk about the numbers and the Patty Silverstein recap and then get into the economics so here's my quote as I was thinking about this so Vanna White picture this she's still on TV she works 48 days a year I want her job. She I makes know. $10 million. Did oh you know God. that? No, year? I had no idea. From the Wheel of Fortune, she makes $10 million working 48 days a year, but that's not the best of her money. She makes more money than that, putting her picture on the sides of casino jackpot machines. Oh, you're kidding me. So she makes more than twice as much. She makes more than she makes from the Wheel of Fortune, having her image on slot machines. So here's my quote as I was thinking about her and we just switched from Fairway Mortgage to One Trust Home Loans. And she said, it doesn't matter where your name is. It matters what your name stands for. So I talked this, I threaded this quote into the presentation last week, but I wanted to say it again because I will say the same for you, for me, for Megan. It's not about whether it's the company that you belong to or some affiliation or association. Uh, and congratulations to the 2022-2023 DMAR new board of directors. I know all of the area associations are going through their change of board right now. What a fantastic night last night. But it's about who you are, especially in a changing market, when buyers and sellers need you the most and they need that direction and advocacy. But I just thought that was a great quote and a great story. And I want to start working 40 days a week. I a know year. that would 40. be so nice. I just got my work life balance for years, for years in this industry. I've been working 60 to 70 hours a week. And it was just, we kind of, it just became what I knew. Yes. And then when I had kids, my work life balance had to shift and I continued to work 60 to 70 hours a week. And With then the when I became a single mom, my work life balance had to completely shift. And now I'm working like 40 to 45 hours a week. And I feel like I have a part time job and all this free time on my hands I need a hobby so if you guys have any <laughs> ideas for hobbies for me put that it I can in the pick, chat the best put hobby. it in the chat what <laughs> hobbies I need to pick up because I've got free time on my hands now when I don't have the kids oh. I don't know what to do with myself and so I don't have that yet yeah no, not with the move <laughs> <laughs> you've got another project I got another on. project you got another project I need a project I need something yeah. to work on that's not stats related because stats has really become my hobby over the years when I get bored I will sit and play mm -hmm. with spreadsheets which is kind of my thing it's okay I know but it works out for the greater good it right does. and so yeah. it's all it's all good it all works out uh and so I wanted to recap a little bit about what Patty Silverstein yeah. talked about last week since we didn't broadcast that part of it mm -hmm. but uh what she was talking about is it is a, is it a recession or is it a correction? And what, what is signaling right now is she looks at 10 different variables in order to determine if we're in a recession or not. And seven out of the 10 of the variables that she was looking at signaled to correction rather than yeah. recession. And so what I'm seeing is more of a correction in our market right now, rather than the seasonal transition that we typically see in terms of ebbing of, of flow of prices. And so usually what happens is our prices are run up from January through June. We end up seeing massive price appreciation yeah. during the first six months of the year. And then what happens is there's a shift between the relationship of supply and demand that happens June, July, and August. And our uh, appreciation actually goes negative for those couple months yeah. while we have a seasonal transition when rela the relationship between supply and demand shifts. Usually September signals one of the best months
wants to be a buyer in this market because you have the most amount of homes available for sale and fewer buyers that you're competing against. So September is a really great month for you to go out and buy your properties. Mm -hmm. Now, going into October, November, and December, we end up seeing our prices tend to stabilize during that point. Well, usually what happens when we have that fallback, we end up seeing that our prices fall back between three to 5%. Well, right now we're seeing more of a correction in place right now where we're 9.9% off of the prices that we were seeing back in April. And so yeah. this is signaling correction in our marketplace, which was badly needed. We couldn't continue to sustain this 20% appreciation year over year. And so we're seeing those prices tend to fall back, but we're still up year to date or year over year by about eight to 10% right. in terms of our price appreciation. So we could sustain this type of market correction and still have a phenomenal year of appreciation in our marketplace. And so it's not anything to be worried about. And I hear a lot of buyers that are saying, well, I'm going to wait for it to fall even more before I go out and make a purchase. Yes. And so I'm having a lot of questions about what are the talking points around that. And again, what I want to tell people is that you marry the house, you date the rate. And when you're paying rent, you're paying 100% interest and not just 6% interest mm -hmm. like you would be right now. Now you can always go back through and if we go into a recession, it's likely that interest rates will fall yeah. and you can refinance at that point. But again, if you don't uh, go through and purchase that house now and interest rates go up even further, mm -hmm. then you'd be happy that you locked in at 6%. And historically, 6% is still a good interest rate. Historically, over the last, what, 30 years, 40 years, the average interest rate is about 8%. Yeah. And so 6% isn't bad. It's definitely not the 2 and 3% that we enjoyed for a couple of years there, but our market simply couldn't sustain moving at that rate again. The demand was completely out of control. We didn't have enough supply. And now we're getting back to a more stabilized marketplace where buyers <laughs> and sellers have the opportunity to negotiate. So this is a good thing that's happening in our market. Our market had to slow down. It did. I mean, everybody wanted it everybody knew we needed it but mm -hmm. nobody actually wants it once it gets here right? right it's one of those things where you cannot sustain 20 to 24 percent appreciation and that was happening because interest rates were below four percent even below three percent and so nobody wants to see a six percent interest rate but in order to stop that kind of massive appreciation you have to slam on the brakes i know the fed chair powell they're looking at those numbers saying we need to see we need to see demand stop mm -hmm. right in order for supply to catch up and we're already mm -hmm. starting to see that but it's in the housing too and when we do go into a recession and when we do see interest rates drop we will see demand pick back up again because demographics tell us that mm -hmm. uh, and that will come right back up again in stable home prices mm -hmm. definitely yeah. and so again you shouldn't be afraid of buying a house right now you're not buying at the top of the market mm -hmm. we're still expecting to see appreciation next year albeit at a much slower rate than what we've been seeing historically but it's still your best investment is to purchase a home so i would still encourage encourage you to get out there and go buy a home, even though interest rates are higher, it's better than the alternative of paying rent. Um, we'll go ahead and hop into the numbers for this last week uh, and talk about uh, what's been happening in the market. Uh, I always forget which slide this is. Okay. Yeah. Slideshow from beginning. All right, so uh, looking at what's been happening in our marketplace, this covers the week of September 4th through the 20th. And so now we're out of Labor Day weekend. We're a couple weeks beyond that. And we've been watching what's been happening in the market. And again, this is your heat map for tracking the inflow and the outflow of new business as we go through the year. Uh, this tracks every single metric that I track on a weekly basis for you. And I go through and stack it against each other so that you can see what's happening in terms of is the market becoming more or less competitive by your scale on the left-hand side. We really saw our market start to shift back over Easter weekend where the market started to pull back and the market has continued to cool since then. Uh, we're starting to see more new listings come on the market uh, just in the just last couple talking. of years. I'm going to stop sharing. Share okay. Yep. Uh, and so looking at, uh, we're seeing some more new listings making their way to market towards the end of the year. So it's still a great time to sell. And when we look at this compared to benchmarks looking from 2013 through 2019, looking at when uh, we're talking about how 2022 is comparing, we're right on those targets for 2013 through 2019. And the outliers really are 2020 and 2021 were the outliers for our marketplace. Uh, and so looking at what happened with our active, oh, no, you're good. <laughs> looking at what happened for our active inventory, our active inventory actually came up this last week by about 4.6%. So there are more choices that are available out there. We're hovering around 6,700 available units for sale. Usually what happens is we trend into September, October, and November, our active inventory starts to taper off. We saw 
big bump of new listing activity last week because it was the week directly following Labor Day weekend. And so uh, the week direct people, people chose not to list over Labor Day weekend, understanding that the market slows substantially over those three day holiday weekends. Uh, and then we saw that big bump of new inventory coming to market, but inventory is hanging out on the market a little bit longer than what it was earlier this year. And so our active inventory is having an opportunity to build back up. Uh, pending transactions came up by about 3.6%. So the majority of that was absorbed as we did have new inventory make its way to market. I've had a lot of questions coming up through about back on markets and what mm. to expect for if the fallout rate. Our fallout rate is still about eight to 9% of units that go under contract end up falling out of contract and coming back to market. Looking at new construction, that number is significantly higher. I was talking to the gentleman over at Zonda, which is the app that uh, tracks what happens with new construction. They said that they had about a 35% cancellation rate right now for new construction. Wow. And so that, and that number is higher. It's down from 40%, which it was yeah. earlier this year when interest rates really made their big jump. Some buyers ended up tapping out and saying, I can't wait, or I can't fix in at that interest rate. I can no longer afford this house. So some new inventory ended up coming back on market that was through partial development at that point. Our month supply of inventory is sitting at about 1.5 months worth of inventory. Inventory tends to grow. Month supply of inventory tends to grow uh, as we get into the end of the year and the market really cools down as we hit the back half of the year. So expect that number to continue to grow. But that basically means for every one buyer in the market, they have about 1.5 homes to choose from. And that's right on pace with where we should be for the month of September based off of data from 2013 through 2019. Again, 2020 and 2021 are real outliers there when we had substantially lower interest rates. Uh, the odds of selling ended up going up a little bit this last week. We ended up seeing it increase by about a half a percent. We're sitting about a 53% odds of selling if you listed last week for the next four week period. And so again, this is where I take into account all of the available homes for sale versus those that go under contract and or close in the same week. And I project it forward for a four week period of time. It's definitely different than what we were seeing earlier this year. And so again, we're off peak pricing by about 9.9%, which is higher than the three to 5% that we typically see signaling more of a market correction right now than seeing a seasonal correction in terms of our pricing. But back here over Super Bowl weekend, our odds of selling really peaked out at about 87.3% odds of selling. And so now we're down to about 53.5%. And again, that puts us back to where we were in 2019. And 2019 is a very similar year uh, to right now because interest rates went up for the first six months of 2019, where we went from three to four and a half percent. And so again, signaling some of those affordability issues that we saw. Um, oftentimes when I'm talking to agents about is don't look at what happened in the market just in the last three to six months, but actually go back and look at what happened in the market in 2019. How long were days on market? What was your close to list mm -hmm. price ratio? What were your price reductions looking like? Because it's a very similar year to 2022, where we saw interest rates go from three to 6%. And so looking at what's happening in terms of affordability, those prices are really starting to pull back right now. Uh, looking at where we would be for a market imbalance, we would still need to have about 28,000 active units on the market market in order for us to truly flip to a buyer's market. Um, somebody sent me a TikTok video this week uh, where oh, the agent yes. was talking about a market uh, that has tr transitioned into a buyer's market. We I are still too. not in a buyer's market yet. Uh, a buyer's market really exists when we have more than six months worth of inventory. For us to get to a point where you have a six month supply of inventory, we'd need to have 28,000 available homes for sale, which would feel so different than so the market that we're in right now. That would feel like a really dragging market, but really that would be the point that we would need to get to before we truly transition into a buyer's market. So we still only have 24.2% of the inventory that we require to offset demand. And so we're nowhere close to a buyer's market. We're closer than we were earlier this year, but we're not anywhere close to a transition where we're going to see home prices fall at a substantial rate, where we're going to see a more significant price correction. And a buyer's market really does defined by a very slow economy. I mean, if mm -hmm. you have that limited kind of inventory, there's something going on to have more homes, more than six months, mm -hmm. you know, or even how we feel it typically, which yeah. is closer to three and a half to four yeah. month mark of inventory, which we don't have. Right. And for us to get to an average or a normal market in Denver, we would have between three to three and a half months worth of inventory. Mm -hmm. And that would mean that we would need to have about 15 to 18,000 available listings for sale. Mm -hmm. So we're still not even back to a point where we would be in an average or a normal market for Metro Denver. Mm -hmm. And it's hard to even come up with an average or a normal number because we went, we transitioned from a very deep buyer's market where we had eight to 10 months worth of inventory into a market where we had three tenths of a month of inventory. And so even averaging it out over those two different markets <laughs> right. doesn't 
necessarily make sense because because in the last 15 years, we haven't had an average or a normal market, except for a very brief transition when we were going from a deep buyer's market into the deep seller's market. And so again, we've averaged closer to about three to three and a half months worth of inventory for us to get back to a more normal market mm -hmm. here in Metro Denver. Um, I did a big study on concessions and seller down payment. Oh, great. Uh, and so I looked at overall for homes between four to $800,000 in the month of August, it was 45% of them offered seller concessions and the seller concession on average was $5,500. And when I took a look in to see what they were paying that towards, it was towards points paid down. So a lot of sellers are offering those points right. paid down. <laughs> I'm getting a lot of questions about, and actually I'll talk about this in a minute when we talk about price reductions, because these two things go hand in hand. But again, we're far from a market that's going to go into a deeper corrective state because we need to have a much more high, a higher supply of homes. We need to have uh, unemployment go up significantly. Unemployment right now is still only 3.6% overall. Mm -hmm. uh, and we would need to have a lack of equity in our market. And so I have some people that are talking about, and I had some people reach out to me on Monday that said that they're in foreclosure, uh, but they're trying to sell the home and they're likely to sell that home and be able to walk away with all of that equity. Okay. As of last month, there were zero closed transactions that were destroyed. And so again, we're not seeing those properties actually taken back by the bank. We're going to short sale, going to foreclosure, going into a HUD home. And so we're still not seeing that massive flood of inventory that would drive our prices down for a more deep correction in our marketplace. And I will say, like based on, we were joking about this as far as on Instagram, I um, I went kind of head to head with a couple of folks talking about the fact that homeowners are not in a recession. Yes, housing has slowed. Um, I know that NAR has come out with a statement on that. The NAHB has come out with a statement on that. Everybody is still waiting to hear, are we actually in a recession? I would say that we aren't yet, but we're heading there rather quickly at this point. But all of it comes down to the data, mm -hmm. I think, right? And having these, these bits, and you don't have to have all the bits because because you can't be Megan. None of us can. <laughs> I'm Megan. You can't. I do this for you. You can't. Exactly. <laughs> so you take the bits that make sense from her half and from my half, the parts that resonate with you that you can rattle off, that you can go into a conversation where somebody goes, I don't want to do that because of a recession. You go, well, I understand if you don't want to take a move right now because it doesn't feel comfortable, because there's an instability in the security of your job. But I really want to talk to you about what's happening in the market because the market is being misled by that headlines. Here's some data points that show how strong the real estate market is, mm -hmm. right? And so when you talk about the things that you just talked about and the days on market and the months of inventory and a balanced market, and then you get into the foreclosure numbers, and I'm going to show a new report that just came out from Black Knight about where we would be if we actually saw 15% drop, all of those things kind of packing those into your pocket to go, I have these bits of facts mm -hmm. uh, that I can pull out when I come up with those conversations, because mm -hmm. you have to. Well, and as our home prices continue to go up, our consumers yeah. are more savvy here in Denver because our average prices are significantly right. higher. The average consumer is going to start to demand this type of information from you. So it's important that you're able to keep this information in your back pocket and be able to advise on what's happening in real estate and really be a wealth advisor. And yes. so you should earn your, your position yes. at the table as their accountant, as their financial advisor, as their realtor, holding on to their largest financial investment yes. and be able to advise people on what's happening with their house and how to use that and leverage that in order to gain massive wealth. And, and we're not saying that you need to be the financial advisor. I know there's a lot of real estate agents that go, that's not my job. And I get that. It's having the A team around you, having the people that you can pull the data that makes sense from the Megan, mm -hmm. Nicole, the CPA, the financial planner. So don't necessarily try to take on that other job, but have the information and the facts available to you so that you can advise them instruct them, and then refer them when the time comes. Definitely. Yeah. So, but we're still far from a market out of balance. And so we have yeah. not transitioned to a buyer's market. Is that market. where we started? Please don't. Yeah. Okay. Please, <laughs> please don't. Please don't put out videos that say that we're in a buyer's market because we're not. Uh, looking at showings for this last week. Uh, how do I get to my next slide? Uh, just over there. You just have to click. Yep. Okay, cool. Sorry. So showings this last week slid by another 2.3%. We had about 13 and a half thousand total showings last week. So that averages out to about two shows per property per week. Um, I'm getting a lot of questions if I'm using broker bay data yet or not. And I can't get the data out of broker bay system in order mm -hmm. to pull in those listings. And so that accounts for about 10% more showings than what I'm able to report through showing time. Going through broker bay and trying to pull out the analytics for that, I have to run 35 searches to get one number and it takes me about an hour 
for. And there are five numbers that I need to go through and pull. And so unfortunately, I don't have five hours each week to go through and pull out just that showing data. But I've provided feedback to Broker Bay saying the data that I need to get in order to produce this report. Hopefully that feedback is heard because showings really lead the way with setting expectations. Yes. Uh, there have been a lot of questions about price reductions lately and when should I reduce my price and how long should I wait to make a price reduction. And so you should be averaging about two shows per property per week right now. You'll get more showings the first weekend that you put up a new listing. Um, I'm getting a lot of questions on Monday saying I put up a new listing. I got absolutely zero showings on it. Mm -hmm. Can you tell me what's happened with showings in this particular area? And yes, feel free to reach out to me anytime. I'm happy to pull that report and take a look at what's going on in your particular neighborhood. Give me something to do on Mondays. And so feel free to reach out. And so don't apologize when you reach out to me to get that report. I'm always happy to pull it for you. Uh, looking at average shows to contract, we're still looking at about 12 and a half to 13 showings to go under contract. So if you've had a total of 12 or 13 showings and no offers on your property, that may be your next signal that you might need to make a price reduction in this market. Uh, looking at median days on market, median days on market has actually started to fall. Uh, we peaked out right as kids headed back to school at about 20 median days on market for about half the listings to go under contract. We're now down to 17 and it's been sliding by one day each week. And so it looks like people are starting to pull back in their pricing strategy and properties are spending less time on the market, but it's just over two weeks right now for you to go on the market. So that could be signal number three that you need to make a price reduction if you've been on the market for longer than 17 median days. Uh, price reductions this last week was about 44.2% of all the listings that went under contract made some sort of price reduction. I've had a lot of questions about do I make a price reduction or do I offer a seller concession? And the answer is actually in 50% in of the cases last month for units that went under contract and closed in the month of August, 50% of them that offered, uh, that made a price decrease also offered a seller concession. Both. Both. Yeah. And so the way that you want to do that is make your price reduction, change in your public remarks that you're willing to offer a seller concession so that that information gets out to the consumer websites. If you put that in broker remarks, that doesn't go anywhere. So uh, buyers won't end up seeing that, but put that into the public remarks field and you'll be able to see that the uh, seller concession will be available at that point or that the seller is willing to offer that. Because if you're only trying to do like the 2-1 or the 3-2-1 buy down mm -hmm. and do a seller concession, you have to reduce the price so that it repushes out, right? Yes. Yeah. yeah. And so when you do a price reduction, it repushes it out to all of the people that have prospect matches at the lower price point. Mm -hmm. uh, and it also refreshes on all of the consumer IDX websites. And so it's a good idea to do that price reduction plus offer the seller concession. That was about 25% of all the properties that closed in the month of August. Uh, looking at price reductions, they ended up going up this month or this week, uh, they were up to about a 6.5% price reduction, which is high, where it's about $46,000 off of the original price. And mm -hmm. so I'm seeing still more substantial price reductions, even as we get into the later part of the year. Typically for the month of September, we end up seeing about a 4.9% price reduction. So a 6.5% price reduction is pretty significant. And I'm seeing more significant price reductions at higher price points right now. I'm going to zip through these last slides. I only have about seven minutes left. So we've gone through in detail how you read through the data. Uh, but you can see that the cooling trend is also set in down here uh, for homes that are up to $500,000. Uh, we had about 1,600 available units for sale. That number came up by about 7.9%. So a lot more choices are available right now per buyer for homes that are under $500,000. Pending transactions actually came up this last week by about 8.2%. We're still sitting at about one month worth of inventory and that number has stabilized for the last four weeks or so where we're bouncing between 0.9 and one month worth of inventory. So the chances of you getting into a bidding war in these areas that are under $500,000, especially as, as you're along the 225 corridor, are still likely. You're not going as high over asking price. You're looking at about right. 2 to 3% over asking price now versus what you saw back earlier this year where it was 8 to 10% over asking price. And so again, the bidding wars have really calmed down if you're likely to be in a multiple offer situation or not. Uh, the odds of selling ended up picking up again this week. And so we saw 63% odds of selling uh, for homes that were up to $500,000. Uh, we only have 16.2% of the inventory required to offset demand. So again, we're far from a market imbalance for homes that are under $500,000. We've seen a lot of downward pressure from people that may have been looking from 500 to 750 are now looking at under $500,000 in light of interest rates going up. So there's been more demand for these homes that are under $500,000 right now. Uh, we were looking at about three shows per property per week. So if you didn't get three showings on your property this last week, you may need to make a price reduction on that property. Uh, we're looking at 12 
12 showings to go under contract for homes up to $500,000. So if you've had a total of 12 showings and no offers, it may be time to make a price reduction. Uh, days on market ended up stretching out. Ooh, that's weird. I wonder why that is showing right there. I'll have to correct that. <laughs> That's not where that goes. Um, <laughs> it usually goes down here. Luckily, it's in the middle. It's, yeah, you can, you can still stuff. see that. Yeah, <laughs> but it's 15 median days on market right now for homes uh, that were up to $500,000. 44.2% of them made price reductions. We're looking at about a 6.3% price reduction for homes that were under $500,000. Uh, 500 to a million, again, that cooling trend really settling in about Easter weekend, continued to cool off since then. This is our most interest rate sensitive uh, bracket of people where the majority of them require financing to get into a property. It's about 85% are using a loan. And so they're very dependent on what happens with interest rates. Our month supply of inventory uh, is down to 1.6 months worth of inventory or for every one buyer in the market, they have about 1.6 homes to choose from. Our average daily active count went up by 3.5% and our pending transactions fell by about 1.2%. Uh, the odds of selling fell a little bit this last week by about two tenths of a percent. So we're looking at about a 50.6% odds of selling, which again puts us back to where we were back in 2019. Uh, we have 27% of the inventory required to offset demand. So again, we're still far from a market imbalance. We're not trending towards a buyer's market in that market either. Uh, you're looking at about 1.7 or two shows per property per week for homes between 500 to a million or about 12 showings to go under contract. So if you've had 12 total showings and no offers, you may need to make a price correction. We're holding fast for the last about four weeks or so. We're about three weeks on market for homes that are between 500 to a million dollars right now. 46% of them reduced their price last week with an average price reduction of about 6.3%. You can see how much those price reductions have gone up uh, since we were back over Super Bowl weekend where we were only seeing about a 3.2% price correction. Uh, for homes between one to $1.5 million, we're sitting at 1.6 months worth of inventory. And so these people are less dependent on what happens with loans or with financing. Uh, and so they're not as sensitive to interest rate. We're seeing more cash transactions that are happening in this one to $1.5 million range. Uh, our average daily active count went up by about 5.3% and our pending transaction count jumped by 21 0.5% this last week. And so there's a very active pool of buyers that are out there looking mm -hmm. for homes between one to 1.5 million. Uh, the odds of selling was up to 49%. And so it increased week over week by about a half a percent. We only have 17.9% of the inventory required to offset demand in this market. So this market is actually more shallow than what's happening between the 500 to a million dollar market. And so this market is moving a little bit faster. Uh, we had about two shows per property per week. So if you didn't get your two showings on your home last week, that could be strike one. We're looking at 12 showings to go under contract. So again, if you've had a total of 12 showings and no contracts, it may be time to make that price reduction. Uh, we looked at 12 median days on market. So days on market are actually lower than what we're looking at for homes between 500 to a million right now. So just under two weeks, 34.7% uh, made price reductions. So fewer price reductions on this one to $1.5 million mark, but the price reduction was substantial. We were looking at about a 10.5% price reduction last week or about a $154,000 price reduction last week for this for homes between one to 1.5 million. Last section that I'll talk about for the weekly numbers is this 1.5 to $2 million price point. We have about a two month supply of inventory right now with 200 average daily active units. Uh, we're putting about 23 units under contract each week where it was about 21% increase over the previous week for units going under contract. The odds of selling was 47.4% for homes between 1.5 to 2 million. Uh, we only have 16 0.7% of the inventory required to offset demand. So this market, again, is even more shallow and trending toward deeper towards a seller's market than what we're seeing at lower price points right now. So there's a significant amount of demand for homes that are over a million dollars. Uh, you're looking at about 1.5 shows per property per week, 13 showings to go under contract. So if you've had a total of 13 showings and no offers, it may be time to make that price reduction. And days on market for units that went under contract last week was seven. So there's this active pool of buyers that are out there for homes between 1.5 to $2 million right. that are just waiting for the right house to come up. They've gone through and they've probably looked at everything that they're interested in, but those homes that are coming to market that are priced right, that show really well, that are between 1.5 to 2 million, are still flying off the shelves. So as you get more expensive, 
you have a bigger buyer pool or yes. at least a more hunger, a more hungry, a hungry buyer. Pool. Yes, definitely. And so, so it's interesting to see that uh, we only saw 13% of what went under contract last week made price reductions with an average price reduction of about 8.3% or about $167,000 off of their original asking price. And so that takes me through everything. We've got some questions that popped yeah. up. So we'll go through and answer those really quick. Uh, and so uh, I'll invite you to my <laughs> bourbon night agent yes. mastermind. That would be Please great. Do. I would love that. That would be fantastic. Uh, And more people need to do that, by the way. That mm -hmm. was a fantastic night. Thank you so much. Yeah, super fun. Uh, And so thanks for clarifying that. I've been been hearing agents and lenders saying that six months is balanced, but I always thought balance was three to five months and six plus was a buyer's market. So yep, we Mm -hmm. covered that for you. Uh, Do you recommend uh, pricing full 9.5% off peakish pricing in the sub $500,000 $500,000 detached single family market. It's hard to say. Yeah. And so I would say, look at those comps. And I would say, look at what's going under contract in your area, in your zip code and in your subdivision right now right. and pricing in line with what's going under contract right now. It may not warrant that full 9.9% off of asking price because our average prices in Metro Denver are closer to about seven uh, $750,000 right now. So that 9.9% reduction may end up being just a little bit too much uh, based off of that peak pricing. And it really depends on the neighborhood that you're looking in. Uh, if you need help with that, you can always email me and I can tell you how much pricing has changed in your zip code over the period of time from peak to now. Uh, my email address is maller, A-L-L-E-R at firstam.com. Fire me an email and I'm happy to look at that. Um, what is a good amount of concession to offer to allow buyers to buy down the rate? Price range is 750 to 850 So if you do a, well, there's two different ways you can do that. You can either do a permanent buy down, which you're not going to get very far for a lot of money right now because the market is so shallow because investors don't believe the interest rates are going to be this high for very long. And all of these mortgages are going to get refinanced. So there's not a real hunger for these higher interest rates. So you'll see that it takes a lot of money to get down low enough that you wouldn't refinance if and when interest rates drop. So where you're better off doing is somebody is a three, two, one or two, one buy down. So you have to look at that purchase price. Let's assume a 20% down. What's the monthly payment at say six and a quarter. And then you take the difference between that six and a quarter and three and a quarter, six and a quarter and four and a quarter, six and a quarter and five and a quarter. And you add up each one of those because each one of those are for a year, the 3% lower for a year, 2% lower for a year, 1% lower for a year. And that's how you get to the number. So any listing that you have, you can do a quick pencil and paper math on that. I'm happy to do that for you as well. Um, But that kind of gives you the formula versus kind of just telling you what it would be for one price point. Mm -hmm. Uh, So you please restate more slowly something I said earlier, and I accidentally missed the first 10 minutes and a couple minutes just now. Mm -hmm. So forgive me, we are forgiven. uh, (laughs) If this is redundant regarding the 9.9% market correction we're experiencing now versus the typical three to 5% or Mm -hmm. three to 7% price correction. So prices have the tendency to ebb and flow as we go through the year. We end up seeing major price appreciation from January through June. And then we end up seeing prices fall back from June. June through about September. Our average prices have the tendency to fall back by about approximately 3.5%. This year, they've actually fallen back by about 9.9% from where we were in peak pricing. So this is signaling more of a correction than a seasonal transition for us this year. We've seen a big swap between the relationship of supply and demand. Prices have fallen back and with interest rates going up, affordability has been impacted. And so in order to get back into the market, we're looking at about a 9.9% price decrease from where we were earlier this year. But make sure you explain that in a way that it's 9.9% off of the 20 to 24%. Yes. It's not 9% yes. or 9.9 off of zero. Like we're not going yeah. down. We're literally taking some of the froth out of the market. It mm-hmm. should never have been there in the first place. Uh, obviously, if you sold during that, you, you had a windfall. Uh, windfall. Uh, if you bought just before the correction, obviously you want to be in that home a little bit longer. You're not buying and selling houses like stocks. No, this, this is, is not, long-term. you're not buying the average yeah. tenure of a homeowner right now is 10 years. Yes. People are staying in their homes a lot longer. Yes. You're going to come out better in the long run than you are in the short run. Uh, any thoughts on land sales or buildable lots? I don't track takes. that. I yeah. actually go to the guys at Zonda <laughs> in order to do that. If you email me, I can connect you with those guys at Zonda and they have a great report that uh, they can put together. Uh, And so regarding lots, how long is it taking to sell them again? I don't know how long it's taking to sell lots. Um, That's not something that I track. I track resale. Mm -hmm. Uh, How is the market during during the holiday season? And so again, usually what happens during the holiday season is things end up slowing down pretty significantly. Uh, And so we end up seeing a pullback in the marketplace as we get closer to those holiday months. We really see that big pullback in active inventory after we get past 
Halloween and we get into right. the seasonal months of Thanksgiving and uh, Christmas. And so looking at those months, uh, the market really tends to cool off with that. But we've got a great opportunity between here and Halloween, I think, mm-hmm. right? For buyers to get out where we're a little flush with inventory, where there's not a whole lot of buyers um, coming out fighting with these higher interest rates. There's a lot of people sitting on the sidelines that aren't going to take advantage of this. They're going to jump back in when the interest rates drop. They're going to see their home prices mm-hmm. even go up further and more competition. So right now is when these buyers need to be getting out before mm-hmm. Halloween. Yep. Yeah. Uh, and so where are we at percentage-wise with multiple offers and cash offers? So mm-hmm. based on data that went under contract last month, Month. It was about 42% of all the homes that were detached single family sold for over their asking price. And it was about 32% for attached single family sold for over their asking price. I'd have to go back through and look at my cash <laughs> offers. Um, I want to say that the cash pool right now is about 20% are purchasing using yeah. cash, about 80% are using financing. Uh, I'm consistently being asked if sellers should rush to sell now or if they'd like to wait until spring as they originally planned. What are your thoughts? I would say if they're buying in this market, sell it now because they're going to reap the benefits of having negotiating power now. But if they're moving out of state, if they choose to wait until March, April, or May of next year, they're probably going to make more money if they choose to wait. Uh, last thing, uh, seeing more activity in townhomes, uh, et cetera, due to interest rates. Actually, yes, our, our, um, attached market is doing better than our detached market right now in terms of months of supply of inventory and how competitive that market is with the exception of the Lodo market. The Lodo market continues to lag behind a lot. And so we're seeing slower activity where we're seeing about 60 average days on market in the Lodo market right now. All right. Well, let's get into the economics and talk a little bit about what the Fed did and what our bonds are doing today because of it. And if you are looking at going under contract this weekend, I will say that your interest rates are probably going to be a little bit higher than before the Fed meeting. The bond market is a little bit out of control right now, and there's a lot of fear going on. And I'll explain that here in just a minute. So we're going to go into, oh, and also uh, we'll send it out in our email. So we email blast everybody with a link back to our agent and I Facebook group, but we did also set up a text group. Uh, Not like you're not already communicated with, but we do do the Saturday blog. And on Fridays, we're going to send out a very quick, here's what the interest rates are going into the weekend. And here's the one thing people are talking most about, whether it's something that's coming up this next week or something that just happened. What is the biggest conversation starter? What's the one thing you need to know? And then what are the rates going into the weekend? So we just set that up. We'll put that in that email. If you don't get that email, you can certainly text me or email me directly and I'll uh, give you the information for the phone number and how to get signed up on that list. So we're not putting people on the list. You have to sign up for that. All right, so let's uh, quickly share my screen. All right, so you know we started out with our quote. It doesn't matter. You know, you guys. It's amazing to me how quickly we need to adjust on our feet. I was talking to several realtors last night at the DMAR uh, inaugural, and it was it, several people. I was like, especially in this market, and they were like, in any market, like they literally came back to me. I was like, you're right. No, you're right. I mean, there's something different about every market. It's just how are you adjusting to the conversation uh, and what, who are you so that when they're thinking real estate and specifically the area that you niche in, they're thinking of you. So really quickly, we're, we're starting to pick up pace on the next big thing. We're going to be sending out uh, note cards and gift boxes and all kinds of great things for the next big thing. We've got a major lineup coming. It's all packed into one day downtown, really high-end hotel, and valet is included. So we went all out. We also have a happy hour after, right after the event. So it's going to be a packed day. Molly Bloom, uh, Lee Brown, Renee Rodriguez, Valerie Garcia. We're going to have not, we've got top notch speakers talking about how to access their database, how to access the people that they want to talk to, and what are the conversations that they're having and how are they having it. Going into 2023, this is the most jam-packed day I could have ever have designed for you. (laughs) So definitely. You? Really? (laughs) You need to be there early and stay late. (laughs) Because that's how we roll. Drink your Red Bull, folks. It's a new day. And of course, Megan's going to be with me. We're going to be sharing some time on the stage as we always do. So, uh, so super congratulations to our our DMAR folks and all the, I know all the associations are running through their, um, their turn of board of directors right now, their inaugurals, which is really exciting. So, all right. So let's start with the Fed. The Fed made history, the third consecutive 0.75% or 75 BIP increase. So this 
hasn't been done to have this kind of speed, these kind of jumps, this is massive. All right, so we were originally expecting about 13, 25 BIP increases at the beginning of the year. So far we've had 12, if you break out the 75 BIPs and that's going to continue. In fact, we're kind of thinking that at the next meeting, so we're in September, we've got two more meetings this year. And at those meetings, they're thinking that we'll probably see another 75 BIP and then possibly pulling back to 25 or 50. As this number goes up, and I wanna actually show you, it's not so much what he did, but some of the things he says. I always talk to you guys about this. It's not about the number, it's about the comments. So he went in saying, we will need a period of growth below trend and softening in the labor market. We just moved into the lowest level of what might be restrictive. There's still a ways to go. What does that mean? So he's been talking last month, because remember two months ago, I showed this last week for the folks that were with us, we talked about the fact that two Fed meetings ago, he talked about, we're going to raise it, we're going to we're gonna make some motion really quickly, we're going to come back down. So the market celebrated that. The stock market celebrated it, and the bond market celebrated it. This time he's talking about pain, pain for households and pain for businesses. Now he's talking about duration. So now not only do we need to go up, we need to create pain. We need to do it for a long time. And I'm not loving what he's saying. And nobody is, and the markets aren't either. But when he talks about, we just moved in to the lowest level of what might be restrictive, here's what I'm talking about. So this is the Fed dot plot, and they come out with this quarterly. So it's not every meeting, it's once a quarter, they come out with this. And they're showing where they want the Fed rate to be at the end of this year. So they want it up around four and a half. We just hit three. Let me let that sink in for a second. They wanted it four and a half by the end of the year. It's September. We're getting close to the end of the year and they wanted it four and a half and we're at three. So we're going to need some swift upticks, right? So the prime rate, and I, I bring this to your attention, the prime rate is typically 3% higher than the Fed rate. And if that's the case, HELOCs, credit card debt, car loan debt, all are going to get a lot more expensive. There's a purpose behind this. He's trying to slow down demand, stop spending. And I know when Patty was with us, she was like, keep getting out there and keep spending. And I love her. And mm -hmm. I would say, yes, keep the economy going. But I'm going to take, say, I'm going to say, take a sabbatical. Like just, we just need a quarter, like three months where people just kind of hang loose. They stay home, they barbecue in the backyard. And maybe you don't go crazy on Amazon and get everything delivered to you just for like one quarter is all I'm saying. We need the economy to slow down. We need the GDP to drop because you guys are 70% of the GDP. Your 70 per consumer spending is 70% of the GDP. So he's saying we just tipped at the bottom of what's restrictive, meaning I'm just coming into the zone where you guys are really going to stop because consumer spending this last month was still up. It was up 0.1%, so barely anything, but it was still up. And that's, mm -hmm. he wants to see that down. Mm -hmm. He wants to see that down. So they also put together the GDP and the unemployment numbers and what they expect. So in June, when they raised the Fed rate versus September, when they raised the Fed rate, they were looking for a GDP of about 1.5 to 1.9. They've dropped that all the way down to 0.1. So they're wanting to see that backing off of the GDP. They're also wanting to see and need to see unemployment go up. And I hate to say that, but people need to lose their jobs in order to stop spending, in order to drop the GDP. And that sounds awful when you put it that way, but there's really no way to get around this. We are gonna have to see loss of jobs and a, an inability to spend in order to see the GDP to come down, in order to see demand to fall, in order to see supply catch up, in order to see this recession and inflation come back down again. I mean, this is that sugar infused high that we're having to pull off of. And if the sugar infused high wasn't as big as it was, we probably wouldn't have the pain that we're having or if we hadn't waited as long. But I'm gonna give Pal a little bit of credit that none of us had seen a pandemic quite like the one that we'd seen. So having done what was done, certainly can't fix it, this is where we are today. The woulda, shoulda, couldas are out the window. So right now we're at 3.7% unemployment and he needs it to go to 4.4, which is a pretty big jump as a percentage. It's not that much different, but it's a lot of loss of jobs and slowing down the economy. But I do still hear and feel that those people buying 
the million, the $2 million, the $3 million homes are much less effective. Mm -hmm. Would you agree? I would agree. And that's what the market is showing as well, is that that million dollar plus market is unaffected. Yeah. The people that have money, they probably pulled it off the stock market. Their their businesses are doing fine because people are still spending. Um, There is definitely a division of who's going to feel this the most, but we are all going to feel it because it is a global recession at this point. Every economy is feeling this to some degree or some level. They also talked about what they want the inflation. They're thinking that it's going to land 2022 still at 5.3. It's at 6.3 today. And then it's going to fall back in 2023. So next year really is, I mean, 2022 was a massive correction year. 2023 is where we're going to start to see more normalized trends, more normalized inflation. I don't know if we'll get all the way back. We, they don't even believe they'll get all the way back to the 2% target, but we'll start heading there. We'll enter into this recession and interest rates will come down as inflation comes down. So jobless claims just came out this morning as well. And we saw jobless claims actually went up 5,000. So a few more people were laid off and actually went on an unemployment. But last week's was revised down 5,000. So they washed out. So unemployment is still staying strong. He is needing to see that unemployment number go up. So overall, Moody uh, Analytics put together, the higher prices mean that consumers are spending 460 more per month at groceries. I got into a debate on YouTube. Now you guys, I'm gonna bring the debate, like bring it on, whether it's TikTok or YouTube or Instagram, my marketing team that comes running in, you got to jump on YouTube and answer this comment. And we do it. And it's with facts every single time I strip the emotion out and I just go, it's just the facts, ma'am. It's just the facts. Yes. People are saying, even on YouTube, somebody came out saying that you're saying that we're heading into a recession, but I feel like we're already there because my grocery bill went up and I'm like, well, your grocery bill went up because inflation is high. Inflation will start to come down after the recession. So it's a series of events that are happening. I get that it feels awful. It does feel awful, but I don't really believe that we're there yet. When people stop spending, we will enter into this recession, which is exactly what we kind of need at this point. That's going to drop the inflation. It's going to drop their rates. Job market still remains small. Consumer spending is still happening. So even though the mortgage rates had spiked, the Fed is still pushing even higher because the spending is still happening. But we talked about this a little bit last week. We're in September where we have a really low comparative number. Next month in October, when we get to compare in the middle of October, when we start to see a comparison of last year of a higher inflation number, we're going to start to see inflation come down because we have this whole string of four months where inflation was higher. The comparative number will come down. We'll start to see inflation come down. Hopefully we're already seeing um, raw goods, uh, the price of those coming down. We're seeing those businesses that were taking a haircut on their profitability, seeing the raw goods coming, the cost of those coming down, making being able to make up some of that profitability, and we'll see some of those inflationary numbers start to come back a little bit back in line. Well, the last time, so in June, when we saw the Fed increase the Fed rate 75 bips, we saw this rally, right? We saw interest rates improve. We saw the um, stock market improve. And then all of a sudden, it just has been sinking ever since because inflation continues to be high. And we saw inflationary numbers this last month come up, up versus down, which is what we thought. We thought we'd hit the top. We're going to see a trend down. Didn't happen. More of a head fake. So with that inflation going up, we're seeing that it's getting worse. And this right here, you can't quite see it, but it is a massive day to day. It is an ugly day in the bond market. It is an ugly day in mortgage interest rates. And it is a wide inversion between the short term and the long term. In fact, the long, the widest inversion I have seen in a long time, maybe ever. So if we're seeing that kind of spread, it's because there's a lot of fear. Investors don't believe that the Fed has inflation anywhere near in control. And that's what we're seeing happen in the stock market and in the bond market where we're losing on both sides right now. So this is just the opposite view. Uh, the first slide was the prices. Uh, this is the yields. The um, This 3.7 is what we're hitting, which is gonna equate to interest rates going above. Just yesterday, they were hovering that six and a quarter to 6.4. Uh, I would expect that they're gonna end higher than that today based on what we're seeing. Uh, as of this morning, we saw this little drop yesterday afternoon. Um, I tried to pull this right before we started, but I hadn't seen it matriculate onto this report yet. Freddie Mac came up. So everybody's hovering in this 6.4, 6.5. I imagine this blue line, which is the 
uh, MBS, the more, well, the mortgage news daily is going to tick up again throughout the day today, and I don't know how high it's going to go. It depends on where we land the rest of the day and what it does tomorrow. So NAHB builder confidence, no surprise, is down. Um, we're going to go look at a couple of those numbers. The starts was actually up month over month. They're still down year over year. Uh, the single family starts didn't go up nearly as much as the multifamily starts. So that's where we're seeing a lot of the build going on right now. Of course, land's expensive. Land will continue to be expensive. It's like the country song, buy dirt. There's truth to that. So as we're seeing this, we're not seeing permits keeping up. So housing starts and permits came out. But when I balance that against, okay, here's my supply. It's down. Uh, starts are slightly up, mostly for multi-units. But permits are down. And that really means we're going to have this lag. We're not going to have enough. Completions, those builders are running off a lot of the inventory. We already talked about the fact of how many people are uh, canceling on their mm -hmm. contracts. Yep. Going back to market, they're trying to hurry up and get all those homes sold, right? Because we don't know how high the interest rates are going to go between now and the end of the year. I see. I think we'll see some volatility still before we get into any kind of recessionary. And they were talking in that. If you looked at that uh, dot plot map, they're talking about the rates going up until March. Mm and then coming back down again. So I was kind of thinking that we might see lower rates in the spring. It might or might not be until the summer. Um, but remember, it's not based on the Fed rate. That's what the dot plot is all about. It's based on inflation. So if they're raising that Fed rate, they could be raising it and inflation could be coming down and our 30-year fixed rates could be coming down while the short term is going up. So that's what we're going to be watching. And of course, we'll be talking about it weekly. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> So supply is not keeping up because we pulled up uh, household formation. So we're still forming around 1.7 million households annually. Now we had this massive spur as everybody, all children got out of the homes, right? People that got divorced, whatever that happened, people formed households uh, and took advantage of opportunities, especially with low interest rates. But we're hovering close to kind of an average of 1.7 million. But if I go back here, the starts are 1.6. Most of those are in multi-unit. The per Permits are down, and you got to think at least a hundred thousand homes are scraped every year. So it's really a hundred thousand less than that. We're not keeping up. We're going to continue to have pressure on inventory in addition to those sellers who are rate locked and won't sell. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, I think that we're going to have inventory gridlock heading into next year. That's going to yeah. prevent us from seeing a big increase in inventory because yes. people have locked in at these interest rates that are at two and three percent. So they're not going to look to move because they're right. happy with their interest rate. A hundred percent. Or they're just going to convert them to a rental. That's what I would do. Yep. Yeah. And I'm sorry that what I love so much is probably going to hurt us as well. Uh, so and demographics is still on our side. So if you look, the largest age group right now is 32. The median age group is 38. If you think about that, they've never seen inflation like we're seeing right now. Uh, the last time we saw inflation like this, it was 40 something years ago, 44 years ago. So, you know, this is huge, especially for these people that are moving into first time home buyers right now. And really it doesn't slant off dramatically until those kids who are 13, 14 years old. So yes, it dips a little bit, but we've got some really strong demographics leading into the next 10 years. It looks a little bit different than what we were talking about a couple of years ago because of this adjustment with interest rates, but inventory is still going to be low. Existing home sales is slowing down. We all know that. It's not a big surprise. First time home buyers, though, are holding their own. Per the national, the NAR existing home sales, first time home buyers were still 29%, which is the same it was last month and the same it was last year. So this is really good. Of course, the numbers are lower because every all the numbers are lower, but their percentage, they're still hanging on with everything that they can. Investors were 16% of that. They were one out of six of those. Demand for design services up shouldn't be a surprise. And I bring this up because we just had a building investment empire a couple of nights ago. And I saw this, the design services, which goes to reconstruction of commercial spaces as well as residential spaces. And it's, you can't quite see it, but it's double backed and it's still, it's up. People are looking at building ADUs in their backyard. They're looking at building uh, additional bedrooms out into the backyard or they're popping the top. They're taking advantage of the opportunity that maybe if I need a construction loan, I do have to refinance, but maybe I could just do it on a HELOC or a bridge loan and I can expand that and still keep my 3% interest rates. What are my options? And that's what I wanted to kind of land here just for a second, because right now, and I would say I, I stood corrected last night, not just in this market, but in any market, adapting how we have conversation with our clients, adapting how we market to the industry, adapting how we operate and the products that we provide 
one of the reasons why we moved to one trust, but even as a real estate agent, who are you in this space? Are you providing a team services? If somebody's not looking to buy and sell, maybe they're looking to renovate. Don't make yourself obsolete, make yourself relevant. What does that look like in a remodeling world, right? Mm -hmm. And maybe you're not making money on it, but maybe you're building up a referral database. Maybe you're referring to, to not only stagers, but now you're referring to architects or, or uh, contractors or designers. And your that referral business is going to come back to you in spades when the market turns, mm -hmm. right? So how are you using this market? And one of those things where we were just talking about the fact that investors are still one out of six. We actually had a building investment empire on Tuesday, random night for a month. Uh, we had it on Tuesday. Day. We had 84 signed up, 72 showed up. That is a really huge number. Usually I'm good for like 50% because people show up last minute. I don't want to deal with it. The kids are sick, whatever the reason. I get it. 84 people signed up, 72 people showed up. That's demand. That's people looking for options. Those, some of those people in that room were sent by real estate agents and they're first time home buyers. They're not investors, but you know me, I get pretty dang excited about what we're talking about. And they leave the room going, maybe I'm not investing yet. Maybe I'm just buying my first time home, but I'm ready to go because this market is the market where I can get in and I'm not fighting against 20 different offers for hundred thousand dollars over asking. So this is a class that you want to tap into, whether it's your first time home buyers or investors, whether you come or you just send your clients, it is a no sell zone. No realtor will be in there trying to steal any clients. So please use this to help you excite your clients who are on the fence or looking to the opportunity to invest in real estate. It is a game changer. Because one of the things that we showed was the fact that the forecast from CoreLogic is that we're going to see 3.8% going forward. And I talked about the median purchase price of 579 in Denver. If you put 5% down at a 3.8% appreciation, 6% interest rate, I got to bump that up to six and a half now. Mm -hmm. But if you did that, you still make your down payment back after the first year. And it's even bigger long-term because real estate isn't, you're not trading it like stocks. Mm -mm. It's a long-term gain. And a lot of people are talking about right now, the risk, what happens if the numbers and the market crashes? I showed this slide last month, but I've had so many conversations around it. I wanted to show it again, that if the whole market drops the entire United States, remember we dropped 25% in uh, the 2006, 2008 recession. If the whole market drops 15%, which is really high considering what we're seeing right now, I don't think, think it's possible. 3.7% of homes will go underwater. 83% of those were people who bought this year. And really, really, people who bought this year, maybe their house is upside down for a hot minute. They didn't plan on selling it this year. So really the big hitch in all of this is don't sell. Just hold on to it, showing you the opportunities to holding on to it even five years. So this 3.7 being underwater is really not about delinquency or foreclosure. It's just simply an affirmation that my home is now worth a little less than I paid for it, but it's okay because I'm going to hold on to it for 10 years, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And then last part. <laughs> bridge loans. I want to talk about one of these new products that we're doing every week, just talking about lending opportunities, things that you can talk about with your clients, giving you ideas. Yes, everybody's talked about FHA, uh, VA, USDA, conventional, you know those products. But bridge loans, just wanted to give you three examples. We're going to send out the slide deck so you don't have to read all this now. We're down to the last couple minutes. But it allows you for buy, to buy before you sell. What happens if you have a home to sell and you want to pay off that whole loan? Like you want to pay it in cash. You don't want to have a loan. Or maybe you just want to pay it way down. You can do that. And you don't even have to qualify if you're purchasing with a bridge loan solely. So we can get around the ATR rules. If you have a standalone bridge. So I've got two examples here. Somebody that was moving uh, and had a, a foreclosure or had, I'm sorry, had a short sale, had a job gap. And within one year, we can get her into an FHA loan but she couldn't do it today. This bridge loan is an interest only loan for 12 months, then it balloons. So the idea is I'm putting you in a loan that I know we can get you out of in 12 months. Excellent also for self-employed. We've got tax season coming up. And if you know one year plus your P&L is stronger, but I gotta get to February, we can do a 12 month interest only bridge loan and then do a refinance in March when your taxes are done. This is a tool, never had it before, absolutely game changer for the clients that you're working with on a regular basis. So with that, I'm gonna end and see if we have any questions uh, really quickly. Let's get those over here. 
Valerie Garcia is amazing. That is a very true statement. Uh, isn't unemployment down because there are less workers in the labor pool, not because a lot of people are employed? I heard that there's 1.98 jobs per person. There are 11.2 job openings. Uh, there are, I can run the numbers to show you consistently and historically how many people are in the labor pool. We did see unemployment go up to 3.7 because more people came in, but our participation rate isn't that far off from what it usually is, but I'll run that report for you mm -hmm. for next well, week. Well, Patty Silverstein last week was saying that yeah. the unemployment rate, the unemployed want to be employed and that yes. they're a very active pool of people who are looking to, for jobs. Right, mm -hmm. right, right, right. Uh, if inflation levels off during the next 12 months, doesn't that make current prices the new normal? It does to some degree we get used to, and we're seeing that we're even seeing buyers come back in the market because they're used to a five handle. Some of them are used to a six handle, not quite many of them yet, but that is you do get used to and wages do go up with time as well. We've seen minimum wage going up and we've seen overall wages going up, not keeping up with inflation, but raising. Mm -hmm. Uh, if it costs more to borrow, won't businesses pass it on to consumers, compounding inflation and the CPI? If it costs more to borrow, businesses will stop borrowing for a minute. That's what he's trying to do. He's trying to stop people from borrowing, whether it's credit card debt, business debt, reinvesting in your business. He's just simply saying, let's hang on for a minute. Let supply chain catch up, reuse what we have, invest in efficiencies um, and create a little less demand for a little more supply. Uh, and it is 1101, so I want to be respectful of that. I appreciate the fact that you guys stuck around. We'll answer these last couple of questions, uh, and then we'll hop with the rest of our day as well. Mm -hmm. You sticking around for another minute? Yeah, I'll stick yeah, I got time. Okay. I'm chopping my hair off at 2 o'clock, so I, until then. I can't I'm wait good to until see then. this. Yep. She, well, talk about what you're doing. Oh, God, short in the back, long in the front, kind I, of a reverse mullet. <laughs> That's going on ahead. It's just, somewhere. it's got to go. It's got to, I have way too much hair. It's got to go. I'm trying to simplify my life. <laughs> uh, all right, Clark, when you talk about inflation versus appreciation in the homes, what you're talking about, that's the pro buying. When we're seeing inflation at eight and appreciation year over year at eight, it seems like a wash. Then appreciation will slip. I've been arguing the long term or short term, as y'all mentioned, because that's what real estate is. But there's a, anything else that you're saying. So there is a difference between appreciation and median prices. And then as inflation slows down, I mean, historically, inflation's at two and appreciation is at 3.6. Those have been the numbers up until 2020. Mm -hmm. um, so we're trying to get to where we're seeing appreciation in our homes slightly above appreciate or inflation. And then that continues to track. And with that, you also see a gradual increases in wages. There is a balance, but remember we have expansionary periods and we have contraction periods and they have to flow into one another. We do have cycles. So this is part of that cycle and rebalancing. How do we sign up for the text messages and the investment empire class? That will be in the email that we send out this afternoon. Uh, did you just say the 2008 correction was 25% home price drop nationwide? That is correct. So nationwide. yeah, here in Denver, that yes. number was 10.2%. Yes, that is correct. So that is a nationwide. And you can go up to Fred and you can look at the HPI, the home price index. And that's exactly where I got that number based on where the home prices were in, two, in their peak in 2005 to where they were in 2009. You could see um, how much the prices dropped. And I just uh, subtracted one from the other and divided. Uh, Todd, did you say that? Oh, no, that's the one we just answered. Nicole, you mentioned something something you love to do, I assume that's rentals, may be affected. Can you expand? Oh, no. I just said that I love, I do love investing in real estate, but having sellers hold on to their homes instead of selling them is also creating an inventory shortage. So the very thing that I love for building wealth is also part of the issue with people holding onto their homes and creating mm -hmm. a lack of inventory, mm -hmm. right? That's all the questions. That's it. That's yeah. all we got. Well, thanks for tuning in, guys. We always appreciate you joining us yes. each week. We'll be back at it next week, Thursday at 10 o'clock with our last update through September. Uh, yes. We'll be continuing again into October. We'll review our calendars and make sure that all everything lines up for Thursdays going into October. But we appreciate you guys. We certainly hope that if we're able to help you better advise your buyers and sellers that we'll in turn get to see them at our closing table. So keep in mind, Nicole Ruth. Yes with yes. One Trust and Megan Aller with First American Title for your upcoming closings. We'd love to have the opportunity to work with you and we hope that you guys have a fantastic weekend. Thanks guys. We'll see you next week. Bye-bye.